Good morning, everyone, and happy Saturday. This is Andrew Kimmins with Kimmins Toolworks. Today, I have a pretty good little video planned. Um, I'm going to be covering just the science of honing different stones, different applications, and things of that nature. I get a lot of questions about what I recommend for honing my tools and things like that. And, and I mean nearly every every day almost. So we're going to cover that and we're going to cover just a broad spectrum of things because honing is really the, the fundamental basis for woodworking and even much more than that. Honing and sharpening things is a kind of a fundamental process that is necessary in many different things, whether it be kitchen knives, lawnmower blades, you know, pocket knives, machetes, an axe. Honing essentially is honing. The steels are different. The, the, you know, the bevel angles are different. All these things are different, but it's the same process, and it's a very simple process. I think, through my personal experience, let's see now, I, I have been honing for about 26 years. And when I started out, I was very frustrated. There wasn't much good information really back then. Uh, and I, I really learned the hard way. And it was, it was difficult. It, it was very challenging. And throughout that process, I've, I've learned a lot of things. I mean, dare I say, I believe I have mastered honing just about everything at this point in my life. I know there's no such thing as true mastery. But when you reach that point where honing just about anything is no longer a challenge and can be done in minutes, uh, I consider that relatively proficient. And I would like for everyone to get to that point. Sharpening in general is something that most people really can't do. I mean, I know a lot of people that when their kitchen knife gets dull, it's like throw it away and buy a new one at Walmart. And that's a philosophy that has led to an incredibly wasteful society, to, to say the least. So <clears throat> honing is an essential skill, I think. And I think that it's an essential skill for anyone. Uh, it's an essential skill in the kitchen. Anyone that cooks should be pretty proficient in honing kitchen knives, for example. So I'm going to lay out the fundamentals. I'm going to lay out the things that I use for different tasks. And I have a, a bunch of examples of different stones here that I prefer for different tasks because no one tool does every job. It's just like with a chisel, for example, or like, like you can't go to the store and buy one socket and expect to do everything with it. It doesn't work that way. And there are some stones that you can get away with doing a lot more things on, and we're going to cover a lot of that today. Um, first off, I would like to say, as far as what I recommend for honing my tools, I don't make a generalized recommendation as to what you should use. Because I always believe that everyone should use what they prefer and what they're comfortable with. Because honestly, uh, everybody's different. Everybody has a different feel. Everybody has, you know, a different amount of pressure they use on a stone. Everyone does things differently. So I can give you guidelines as to what I prefer, but that may not be what you prefer, what you prefer. There is no right and wrong here. This is not a right versus wrong thing. Honing in general is very, it's very subjective. It's very open to your own interpretation and it's okay to do things differently than others. You know, you'll, you will hear me say many times, there's no wrong. As long as you're achieving the correct end, res end result, honing is a means to an end result, and that is it. And I think my biggest failure in honing when I was starting out was I really began to notice this failure when I got into straight razors, which was about 10 years ago, where you almost get too particular too obsessive, too into it. And it reaches that point where you just start to shoot yourself in the foot. 
And that's very, very easy to do, especially for somebody like me that's, that's kind of nerdy about it and obsessive with it and things like that. You can go too far. And I think that the most important fundamental thing to remember in honing is that it is a simplistic process. It is one of the most rudimentary things imaginable. I mean, this goes back to, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, people grinding edges on rocks to cut things. I mean, this we're literally still doing the same thing, just with a little more advanced stuff, a little more advanced blades and rocks. But still, I mean, <laughs> you, you get the point. But anyway... I'm going to start by discussing, since I'm a tool maker, what I prefer for woodworking tools, why I prefer it. And like I said, there's no right or wrong, but I can tell you if you do a lot of honing and you are interested in quick and very good results, like for example, I can set up and hone 30 chisels in 30 minutes. And I mean to, to absolutely razor sharp. And I think anybody can get there with a little bit of practice because it's just so simple. It's all about having the right tools for the job. And that's what I'm going to address right now. So as far as honing woodworking chisels, which I'm not going to be honing a chisel in a video, I will be doing that in a video, but right now I just wanna talk about the theory, the equipment, and how everything works. But this is a chisel that I actually have to hone today. This is one of my personal chisels that I was using during the week. I've been doing electrical work in my house. And with that old, old, it's framed with that old native lumber. And that wasn't even what, what dulled it. What dulled it was hacking through plaster. I was just palm whacking it through plaster and scraping with it. So she really needs honed. Um, so I'll be doing that today. And right now I'm gonna lay out what I think works best as far as tackling honing chisels. You have a few different categories of stone. And I have some examples out for all of these so that you can get a really good idea of what I'm talking about here. These are the stones, I'll pan the camera down a little bit. These are the stones that I use for honing chisels. These are the ones that stay out in the shop. These are the ones that pretty much never go in the house. I don't use them for anything in the house. These are my shop stones. And I will tell you right now, as far as honing woodworking tools, I prefer honing on oil and you don't need fancy honing oil. I hone with WD-40. The viscosity of WD-40 is absolutely fantastic for honing tools. And a huge part of why I like to hone with oil is because steel and water doesn't mix very well. Um, <laughs> especially with what's in water these days. If you go and you grab some tap water, there's chlorine in it. It can be highly corrosive. It's just, I mean, it's messy. And with water stones, you have to constantly be lapping to keep them flat. Like with the harder steels, you can gouge into the stone. <clears throat> it's just kind of inefficient in my life for honing woodworking tools. I love honing on oil and I love these right here. I have a pile of Arkansas stones and I, I only buy Arkansas stones from a company called Dan's Whetstone Company. You can see right there, I highly recommend Dan's. Of course, if you have a different brand that you prefer, that's awesome. It really doesn't matter. But what's great about Dan's is the quality of these stones. And mind you, Dan's doesn't, doesn't I don't make any money recommending Dan's stones. I just recommend them because they're good. If you look at the quality of that. I mean, this is still dirty from honing yesterday, but this has what's called a burnish on it. And a burnished stone means that it's almost glazed from use to where it has a nice shine on it. 
So this has a, a fairly good burnish compared to a side that doesn't really have a burnish. I mean, some of that is oil as well, but you can really tell when you look at it in, in real life, in person, what, what that does. But the reason why I prefer the stones from Dan's is they're, they're always flat. If you buy a stone from Dan's, you don't have to lap it. It is good to go. I have bought a lot of stones from Dan's. I actually have more of these in the house, believe it or not. And I have never had one that I've had to lap. And I've checked them all. And that is a really big deal when you get into buying Arkansas stones. Because this may not really look like it, but this is a solid piece of quartz. For the most part. This is 99.9% quartz, I believe. And quartz is very, very hard to lap. It's not like lapping a water stone that's kind of soft, like lapping sandstone or something. You are lapping a solid crystalline rock. So it is very important to just buy them flat, save yourself the time. You're going to pay more getting stones from Dan's. And to me, that's okay because it's, it's worth me not having to lap them. And to add to that, these will stay flat. I can't tell you how many thousands of edges I've honed on this stone. And it is still flat and it will be flat. It will be flat my entire life and the lives of my kids, and probably my grandkids. This is not something that needs maintained. So if you're a person like me that likes efficiency, likes a really good result, and doesn't want to worry about corrosion on a blade, oil, oil stones like Arkansas stones and these DMTs, they're the way to go. You will save an incredible amount of time. The oil, mind you, can get messy, but so can water. I, I, I don't really prefer that personally and another fun thing this by the way this is a black arkansas stone that's what those are called and there's another type of arkansas stone that's a it's called a translucent which performs about on the same level as a black but it is literally translucent or translucent pinkish and they're really pretty i don't have one out here um let's talk about the step up from this in grit. So this is one step coarser. This is the finest. The black Arkansas, that's the finest. I'm gonna pan this down a little bit. Black Arkansas, Arkansas is the finest. I'll leave this cover off so you can see it. The next one, the next most coarse is a hard Arkansas stone. This is a hard Arkansas. This is the very, these are the very ones that your tools are honed on if you buy tools from me. And what you can see here is that you'll get some variation in these. You see some white specks and stuff in there. That's totally normal. It's a natural rock. These aren't synthetic. And these these just perform great. Always flat. And uh, they're, they're beautiful. They're very aesthetic. They're nice to look at. And I like that. Then from there, you go down to what's called a soft stone, a soft Arkansas stone. And this is kind of a medium. And once again, you'll get variation, and they're, they're beautiful stones. There's reddish pink in there, there's gray, there's black, there's white, there's streaks of orange. It's, it's beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful stones. See, and this is another soft Arkansas stone right here that doesn't quite have the character to it. But these are the same stone. They perform the same. They're both soft Arkansas. They just look different. Now, I normally <clears throat> will not use these three in my honing process when I hone tools because it's a redundancy for the most part since I start out on DMTs. These are the DMT plates that I keep out in the shop. I have four that I prefer to use and these uh, in in you know, from coarser to finer. This is an extra coarse. This is a coarse. This is a fine and an extra, extra fine. This one's about 8,000 grit. Um, I believe these are 1,200. This is 300. I honestly don't know off the top of my head, but you, you can look it up. They have a chart. So a lot of times after I grind the primary bevel, and I'm gonna go to hone the chisel, I will just start on the fine, and I usually don't need these to hone. I will go fine, 
and then hone it to where a burr comes up that I can feel with my thumb. You'll feel on the tool. And then all you have to really do is put some downward pressure on it and drag it like that and fold that burr up. And then you go back to the stone and then start on a forward pass and it snaps the burr off. And then you bring it back out to the edge. You can feel it and check it. If you do that a couple times, you know, break the burr off, go back to the stone and do a couple more, you'll be all the way out to the edge without a burr. You will have formed the, the, the apex as fine as you'll get on a fine stone. From there, I'll move to the extra, extra fine DMT, which is roughly an 8,000 grit. And I'll perform pretty much the exact same thing. I'll do a handful of strokes, maybe, maybe 10 strokes. It kind of depends on the size of the chisel. But let's say I do 10 strokes, same thing. I'll fold the burr like that. Like I'll take it and I'll go like that with a good amount of pressure, you know, a fair amount of pressure. And I'll start again on a forward stroke and you can feel it catch as that burr snaps off. It kind of will hesitate. You'll put pressure on it and it'll go and then stumble and go and do a couple a couple more strokes the second time, snap the burr off, and then I'll go to this and I'll finish on this. By then, I mean, you're done and you have an edge. Sometimes it takes twice, you know, go, go do, you know, 10 strokes, snap the burr off, go back in, maybe do, depending on, on where the edge is, anywhere from as little as two strokes to maybe five to finish it out. And I hone the M4 the same way. When you use this setup, these stones are all so hard and they have so much cutting power that it just doesn't matter. And you can hone M4, you can hone A2, you can hone whatever. And yeah, there's differences. They take different a different feel. They take a little practice. But um, they're, they're, these will hone anything, anything on the planet. And I like that. It doesn't matter what you're up against. If you have DMTs, and just a black Arkansas, you're good to go. You're, you're set. One thing I will say <clears throat> here, because I know I recommend this stuff to people that want to follow my method. Totally okay to follow your own method, but if people want to follow my method, I do recommend these brands, Dan's and DMT, both made in America. Um, this right here, the DMT Diasharp Extra Extra Fine 8000 Grit. I will definitely put a little disclaimer here that when you get these, they do not perform like 8000 Grit. Literally not even close. There will be big diamonds. It will, it's, it's very rough. And when you start using it, you'll look at it and you'll think that you ripped all the diamonds off the surface. You'll see, like, it looks like, when you look at it, it looks like everything came off the surface. And you're like, holy crap, there's just bare steel there. What a piece of crap stone. No, it's, no, that's what it's supposed to do. That right there is what it's supposed to do. And with use, and when you break it in, it just looks like everything's wore off of the stone. But no, it performs like an 8,000 grit now. And they will stay good for a very, 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 very long time. It's just that break-in process is significant and knowing what you're getting when you get one of these so that you're not disappointed is a big part of the process because I, I learned that, I got that, and they're, these are pretty expensive. They're one of the most expensive ones. And I was pretty upset, but I figured, you know what? DMT has never steered me wrong. I'm just gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. I, I went for it, I stayed with it. It just got better and better and better and better and better. And now this thing has been in use for about three years and it's still still going just fine. Um, all of these are about three years old. They last for a very long time. And as you all know, I do a lot of honing and these stand up to all of it. Um, the extra course is a very nice thing to have. If you're going to be lapping some chisels that need a lot of material removed, these will most certainly do it. I think this is the extra course. Yeah, this is the extra course. And that sucker is coarse. And these come extremely coarse. All of the DMTs come much more coarse than what is stated. That is my belief. But they all break into being fantastic. 
So that's what I use for honing tools. And mind you, I also hone my knives, like my pocket knife and stuff like that on these. This is the pocket knife that I like to carry. I guess it's not really a pocket knife. It's a, it's a very large knife. It's a bench made. I don't remember the, the number on it. 810 and it's a it's a great knife and i actually usually usually i'll just hone that up on this fine stone just by feel and that's it just this is cpmm4 blade so i'll do that like once a week good to go you don't need any rigs you don't need any honing fixtures you don't need any crap you just need to know where it's dull focus a little bit of effort on where it's dull which for me is typically in this curve right here i use that for cutting most so i put some extra strokes on that i don't have oil on it but that's okay and that's it it definitely pays to just get used to doing things by hand because once you have reached a point of competency doing things by hand, uh, the efficiency is nuts. Like you, you look online and you see all these sharpening fixtures where you put your knife in a clamp and there's this stupid thing that does all that. And it's like, yeah, that's that's cool. But like, I, I don't have time for that. <laughs> I... <laughs> Yeah, no, nobody has time for that crap these days. So it definitely pays to just put the effort into getting comfortable with it. And a lot of people ask me, I've been asked a lot of times, like, what, do, what angle do I sharpen knives at? I don't freaking know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I sharpen them by hand at the angle that I like. I have honestly never measured it. And usually it doesn't really matter to me as long as I get good performance characteristics out of it really who cares uh with chisels it's different with the pocket knife you use it, it doesn't really matter okay so we've covered those stones we're going to move on to some other things now uh this is a category of stones that most people prefer i i, I am completely understanding of that i know most people like this kind of stuff these are water stones a couple examples that i grabbed from inside the house these honestly haven't been used much lately but this is a norton it's an 8k 4k combo and as you can see i've used that 4k quite a lot it's it's pretty pretty dang worn down but this was actually the first stone that i got for sharpening straight razors and i shaved off of this 8k for years and it's it's still still a good stone. It's nice to have. Uh, a lot of people prefer to sharpen tools on these. I I don't. Uh, this is another type. This is a Shapton that I like. And this one's probably super dirty. I bet. Yeah. I haven't lapped this in a long time. But this is a uh, Shapton ceramic whetstone. And these perform really well. These these are good water stones. The Shapton glass are really good water stones too, but I don't prefer them for tools. They do make a really good edge for cutting wood. And there's no doubt about that because what works best when cutting wood is an aggressive toothy edge, something that's very slicey, like an edge that works well on a straight razor. You know, for example, an edge that would work very well on a straight razor is not really the same edge that would work really well on a cutting tool because you want it to be a little more aggressive for a tool to really slice through those wood fibers, almost a little bit toothy. Whereas a straight razor should be an edge that's very smooth. You don't want that toothiness because that toothiness cuts your skin. And it, I mean, it'll cut your hair too, but it will cut your skin. It will grab and cut your skin. So the water stones, whereas I do not use these, for my personal tool honing. I do like them and I fully admit that they make a very, very capable edge for woodworking tools. But so do oil stones largely, which honestly the black Arkansas does yield a smoother cutting edge than the wet stones. So one could argue that maybe 
the whetstone cutting edge would be a little more bitey, but for me, it's not worth the loss of efficiency. It's not worth the water mess on my bench. It's not worth constantly having to lap my stones. It's, it's to me, it's not worth it for that. Um, I do have this. This is a really awesome example of an Arkansas stone. This is well, well worn. And as you can see, that was sliced out of an actual rock. And there's even a fossilized seashell in there. This is one of my favorite stones. And these actually, these perform really good. <clears throat> you can tell, and I don't remember uh, what it is, if it's North or South Arkansas, but you can tell where those stones come from based on the sulfur content. Because I, I don't remember which one it is, so I'm not gonna say, but this one, when you go to lap this, it has a sulfuric smell to it. So it's not from the same place as, as the Dan's. Dan's is from a, a different part of Arkansas. But I thought that was just a cool thing to show. I do use this for razors and I have for quite a long time, but uh, I probably haven't used it for a razor in three or four years, but I used to, <clears throat> and it well, you can get a good edge on it. Now, <clears throat> moving on to Probably, if I had to pick, what I think is, well, for me, the best best stone for honing a straight razor, uh, not for honing a tool, not even so much for honing a knife, but the best stone for a straight razor, it comes down to these little guys right here. Now, the yellow ones... <clears throat> are stones called Belgian codicles. And you can get these in two different grades. You can get standard or select grade. Personally, I go with the select. There's a huge debate that's been ongoing for a very long time whether or not there's performance differences between the select and standard, but you know, I don't even want to get into that. I buy the select. They perform well. I'm very happy with them. And if anyone's interested in, in acquiring Belgian codicles, I know a guy who actually gets the best of the best of the best that are imported into the United States. And I could I could set you up with them. Now they're these are these are very expensive stones. These are not throw around beaters. These are kind of like in the category of prized possessions. Each one of these is hand cut, hand lapped, and if you'll you can see the surface on them is really beautiful. This is a natural rock. And this piece, the yellow piece, is the Belgian codicle. The back is non-functional. That's a piece of slate. They glue the Belgian codicle onto a piece of slate just for stability. And these are these are incredible stones for very fine honing. And the the real benefit to these is because of how smooth of an edge you will get on these is absolutely insane. This is another example of a smaller select grade Belgian codicle. They're, they're really beautiful stones. I like them a lot. These only come from one place in the world. And they're, they're some of my favorite, favorite things. So needless to say, these stones, they, this, they haven't been out in the shop, I don't think other than for, for videos or for pictures or whatever. But this comes out of the exact same vein as these. This is called a Belgian blue. And you can tell why it's called that. It's a blue purple stone. And <clears throat> they say roughly that the codical performs on about an 8,000 grit level. And then the Belgian blue performs on about a 4,000 grit level. I... I don't really know how they figure that. These don't have a defined grit. They just kind of are what they are. I will say that this is more coarse than that, and this is very fine, and this is still very fine. That's all I'll say. I will not try and assign a grit to a natural stone. Frankly, that's kind of stupid. All the particle sizes are different. Um, this right here is a small piece of a Belgian codicle that's a rubbing stone used to work up a slurry on these because you hone with water on these honestly you can own with oil on these they're not porous it won't absorb you can wipe it right off but this is primarily used with water so what you would do is 
apply a little bit of water and then you take this rubbing stone and you rub it on the surface until you work up a milky colored slurry and then you can go through and hone your razor on it and progressively the the slurry itself breaks down and you add water to dilute it until the slurry is completely gone and broken down all the way and that itself takes the edge finer and finer and finer it's a one stone honing process from top to bottom and then when you're done with your bevel you pretty much clean the stone off and you finish it on the bare cuticle with water so you can do the entire honing process of a straight razor with this if you work up a slurry that'll emulate a pretty medium coarse <clears throat> cut and take it all the way down to fine so these are these are incredible little stones and anybody that's into honing and is a honing nerd or loves straight razors i, I would hi highly recommend belgian cuticles they're awesome and they take a lot of practice honestly this isn't like a you pick it up and you can just use it immediately these are very complicated and you kind of have to crack the code to each one of these they all hone different they're all natural rocks so you you get a new codicle it's exciting it's beautiful everything's cool and then you spend a while trying to figure it out because every one of them takes different honing procedures to master but these have been around forever uh these go back to the time of the the romans i believe discovered these you know barbers and the you know 16 17 1800s use these these are always been prized possessions of barbers but and the belgian blue is awesome it's beautiful you can use it in the same kind of way if you work up a slurry on the belgian blue it's a beautiful like blue purple muddy slurry it's really really cool and if you're one of the lucky ones out there that has ever found because i know that they do these that that one one mine that these come out of or the one vein that these come out of i have seen them take a codicle and glue it not to a piece of slate but onto the belgian blue and have a two-sided codicle belgian blue i would love to have one of those i have never had the opportunity to acquire one unfortunately but someday i will find one <clears throat> anyway then you get into specialty stones like this this is a straight razor stone a double duck double duck was a razor manufacturer uh, back in the day and they make really good razors german steel i have one actually it's my my favorite razor to use is a double duck they perform really well but and this is a two-sided stone and this is a barber stone a lot of barbers would carry these and i still have the original thing in here and the box for it and i don't use this i just have it because i like it i don't even remember where i found it but it's it's super awesome to me because I am a honing nerd. So, hopefully that is a good, relatively brief breakdown of the philosophy of, of honing in stones. And it's most important to remember that there really is no right or wrong as far as procedure goes. It's a very simple process. Keep it simple. Don't overthink it. A lot of people, you know, will spend an hour honing a chisel and it's frankly... 59 minutes of that is often wasted time and you'll end up getting an edge that is oh you know the tool's only gonna hold as fine of an edge as it can hold every steel has limitations so to sit there and to hone a woodworking chisel out to 20,000 grit well the first cut not only is it not that 20,000 grit edge the edge will deform and it will actually perform poorly because it'll have a jagged bent end on it. So your best performance characteristics are going to be had with a clean apex, which is why I recommend breaking that burr off, starting on a forward stroke the next time, because that will ensure that you have a clean apex. That is what honing is about. Honing is about achieving a clean, fine apex, and, and it's needless to go past we're pretty much a black Arkansas stone with just about any steel. Um, I know a lot of people will hone things out to, no, not tools, but straight razor guys will spend, you know, all day honing something out to 64,000 grit. And it's, it's a waste of time. It's absolutely not going to perform past about 10,000 grit. 
Uh, 10,000 grit is about the peak of performance for a straight razor. Anything past that is a waste of time. And not just a waste of time, counterproductive. Because if you end up with a burr on the end, like what a lot of people do, a lot of people spend a lot of time, they'll lap and then hone and lap and hone. Well, all that does is sort of culture that burr and draw it out. And then you go and you shave here and you say, man, that sucker's a sharp edge. And then you cut a piece of wood and the edge is gone because the edge went like this. It went and bent over. And all steel will do that. It doesn't matter how, how good or bad it is. So there is a point, not, not of just diminishing returns, but a point where you're shooting yourself in the foot. And I think the best advice that I can give everyone learning at, at any stage of learning to hone is to keep it simple. Don't overthink it. It is a simple process. You are rubbing a piece of steel on a rock at the end of the day. And it's about achieving a sharp, clean apex with no burr, no jagged stuff on the end of it. And that's it. So keep it simple. Uh, for a lot of people that struggle with honing, don't give up. A lot of times you're overthinking it and you just need to step back a little bit and try a different method. And it never hurts to try different methods. I'm constantly trying different methods. I constantly change what I do. I'm always trying new things because it's, it's important to me. One of my philosophies is like, I, I don't just assume I'm right because I have experience with something because there's a lot of people out there that have experience with stuff and I'm always willing to listen and try what they do too. Sometimes it works for, for me and it's the best advice ever. Sometimes it really doesn't apply to my life. But either way, everyone has varying experience levels, some higher than mine, and that's just the way the world works. So be open-minded, try new things, uh, try different products and see what you like. I know a lot of them are expensive, but if you slowly acquire a lot of these different stones and try them out over time, you know, it's it's not that bad. I know just the stones that I've had on this bench are probably like $2,000 worth of stone. So I know it's, well, not $2,000. Well, those codicles get pretty expensive, but um, yeah, just try new things. Simple process. I don't want to drag this video out too much longer. So I'll wrap it up right here and uh, never give up, always practice. Try and perfect methods, develop your own methods. You know, if you think you have an awesome method, share it with me. I'm always open-minded to, to anybody's procedures or processes. So hopefully this helps anybody out there and kind of enlightens them as to really the true underlying simplicity to honing. And I hope everyone out there has a great weekend and I will see you next time.